Thanks for the opportunity to just mention a few words uh, before, of course, our esteemed panel can, can take this on. But as you know, the, the 3rd of May is the World Press Freedom Day, and uh, UNESCO is the UN agency um, responsible for the issues of press freedom and, and safety of journalists and freedom of expression um, is one that definitely organizes a big conference every year. There's also a prize, a World Press Freedom Day prize uh, that's given out, uh, um, and this year the laureates are the uh, the Reuters uh, journalists uh, Kai Oso O and Walon who are in prison in Myanmar. So they will be receiving the prize on the 2nd of May. So this coming week in a, in a big conference in Addis Ababa uh, that's being hosted by the African Union. It's the first time actually that uh, a geo, uh, regional um, organization partners with UNESCO to organize World Press Freedom Day and so putting this really very much at the at the center of priorities for for the African continent which is a great sign um, other than the, the big global conference in Addis Ababa where where most of the international community will be uniting around uh, this at the UN headquarters not too far from here just a few blocks here in Midtown we're also going to be uh, hosting an event um, on the theme of this year, World Press Freedom Day, which is Media for Democracy, Journalism, and Elections in Times of Disinformation. And we'll be very happy to have uh, Alex there with us uh, to speak uh, also a little bit about, about this uh, summit that you're having and also the work of different NGOs um, and uh, as well as, as other uh, players that we usually uh, tend to come together from academia, um, the diplomatic uh, core and, and UN bodies coming together. So we'll have some pamphlets outside there just at the table and you're welcome to all come and, and sign up just RSVP and uh, don't hesitate to come over it's the 10 o'clock in the morning um, on Friday the 3rd of May thank you very much Okay, well, I don't want to take too long to introduce the panel, um, as they're all very well known. I'll just introduce your moderator, David Rode, um, the executive editor of The New Yorker Online, previously with Reuters, uh, The New York Times and Christian Science Monitor, and um, a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting. And I will allow him to introduce the panel and get us going. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is on? I guess so. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, you know, our topic is using disinformation to paint the press um, as the enemy. You have three um, experts here are all working in different ways to fight back and to not accept um, this new attack on uh, press freedom. Um, I'll introduce the panelists first, then they're each going to speak for a few minutes. We'll, we'll talk a bit among ourselves, but most importantly, I want to open this up to questions for the final section and let you drive this uh, important conversation. So again, sort of dark, challenging times, but three energetic visionary people are here to tell you how we can respond. On the far left is um, Christophe Delors, who's been the Secretary General of Reporters Without Borders since uh, 2012. Uh, based in Paris, RSF assures the promotion and defense of freedom and information around the world. Um, next to me is uh, Diane Foley. She's a close friend of mine, I would like to say. Uh, the mother of five children, including American freelance journalist, American freelance conflict journalist, James W. Foley. Diane founded the James W. Foley Legacy Foundation in September 2014 uh, with her husband, John, Jim's father, who's up there hiding in the back row. They're an amazing family. Uh, they founded the foundation less than a month after Jim was executed. Since then, uh, Diane, with John's support, has led the foundation's efforts to fund the start of Hostage US and the International Alliance for a Culture of Safety among Journalists. Uh, on my right is Rob Mahoney. He's a journalist and a fighter for press freedom who's been at the forefront of the struggle for journalist safety and the right to report since becoming the deputy executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists in 2007. Since then, Rob has helped lead the expansion of the organization's reporting and its advocacy, particularly around the intersection of technology and press freedom. He also helped uh, CBJ establish an emergencies response team. So I'm, I've asked each of them to speak for a few minutes about how you counter the tactics, governments, it's really governments at this point, the use of dif disinformation to delegitimize journalists and to press them as the enemy. I've asked Christophe to go first. There's uh, several initiatives, two initiatives that RSF um, is promoting around the world that I think are very exciting and, and fill me with hope. Thank you, David. The different logics to fight disinformation, target disinformation. 
adopt countermeasures. That's what a lot of governments, governments want to do now. They try to implement new content regulations. But in the current ecosystem, it should fail. There is another logic, which is to impose principles to create a new system of safeguards, and that's the one uh, that I will introduce. But first, regarding the challenges that journalists are facing, they are facing violations of their rights. They are threatened, killed, jailed, etc. There are a lot of UN resolutions on this, but without any implementation mechanisms, we launched with many organizations, including CPJ, the Protect Journalists campaign for the creation of a special representative for the safety of journalists. But beyond those visible prisons, there are the invisible prisons. No bars, no blood, no identified victim. Just the right to trustworthy news and information is violated through the control of news and information through money, laws, technology. How do we address this? That's more complicated. That's the purpose of the Journalism Trust Initiative that I will speak about later. And then, above it, there are the new rules of the international game. What do I mean? 70 years ago, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted with its Article 19 on freedom of opinion and expression. Freedom, freedom of opinion means that it has to be based on facts. In fact, in the history of democracy, the safeguards for freedom of opinion, for news and information, were created on a national level. Constitutional guarantees, media laws, invisible for the public, but with, in democracies, many virtues, and self-regulation. In the new global and digitalized information and communication space, with no more distinctions between public and private space, no more distinctions between um, uh, sectors for regulation, no more distinctions even between human beings and algorithms, those guarantees are swept away. So the question is, how do we rebuild a system of guarantees in the current world? Not getting back to the former world, but adapted to our technological world. So that's how we considered, and sorry, and just to, to if we have a look on what happened. For the first time in history, we accepted, as consumers, to delegate the, man the management of the public square <coughs> to private entities. In the recent past, parliaments with checks and balances were establishing the norms, the laws of the public square, of the public space. Now the guys who create the norms are on one side Mark Zuckerberg, on the other side, I do not compare him with Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> Xi Jinping. What do we, do we have to say to these people? Should we, okay, delegate them the creation of norms, but according to certain obligations? That's the purpose of the information and democracy um, declaration that we established with a commission of 25 <laughs> famous uh, um, Laure uh, Nobel laureates, uh, specialists of new technologies, journalists facing authoritarian regimes, etc. So that we could get a commitment of 12 heads of government and state of all the continents last November. They committed to sign a concrete partnership within one year. It should be done in the next few months. It should even be part of the next G7 summit. It enters a new legal logic which really aims at putting principles in this space. Just to give you an example, the laws were transparent. We knew the laws. Now, they are not transparent anymore. 
the square of the village, the public square, was politically neutral. Of course, not the actors, but the square itself. Now, are we, do we know if Chinese platforms enter markets? That, do we believe that there will be no bias? And do we have safeguards that Mark Zuckerberg will never introduce bias? Is this just his freedom of expression? So that, those types of challenges that this work um, is uh, about, we will create a sort of new uh, legal framework on an international basis for platforms based on a vision of a commission that has been composed by the uh, civil society. And then, but I will stop uh, here, uh, once you have defined that trustworthiness of news and information has to be promoted, there are concrete cha challenges. How do you do? How do you, if you are Mark Zuckerberg, decide that you should promote on your algorithmic indexation this type of content or this type of content? That's not easy at all. Because, in fact, platforms are blind. They are blind regarding the way contents that are published on the platforms have been produced. Mark Zuckerberg, or Facebook, and others, Google, etc., they do not know how this video was produced. Was it sponsored by interest? Was it dictated by somebody? So they don't know how to distinguish contents that are close to journalism and contents that are pure advertising, propaganda, etc. So we create, we are in the process of creating a mechanism through standardization. In fact, sorry, may I take it? No, of course. We take like the code of ethics of the SPJ, which has always been a reference for myself in France, I have to say. Um, and with other types of codes, we, <coughs> along with uh, 120 other entities, Associated Press, BBC, Guardian, Gazeta Viborcha, in many, many countries, um, we create, we agree on standards so that it will allow for certification and then it's a way to negotiate with platforms, with advertisers, with regulatory bodies that they will give incentives for the contents that have been produced according to certain processes without entering any logic of censorship. So we try to find concrete solutions to address the problems of our times, to be able to continue to defend journalism, journalism because of course quality journalism is one of the best <laughs> ways uh, to combat uh, disinformation. But if we just help journalists, and if the rules of the game are totally against them, we will lose the game. So let's try to define the rules. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christophe. Um, Rob, I want to ask you about what is CPJ doing? What are you doing personally to counter disinformation about the press? Well, thank you, David, and, and thank you to SPJ for uh, organizing this panel. Uh, what I want to say uh, takes up what, what Christophe was just saying. We're talking about the rules of the game, and you look at it from a very broad perspective. I'll focus a little bit more on what misinformation or fake news, whatever you want to call it, actually uh, means for individual journalists and, and news organizations and how they have to combat it. And one of the things that we've noticed is that less than a decade ago when these social media platforms became available, journalists were jubilant. Suddenly those in authoritarian countries who couldn't get access to the airwaves or couldn't get access to print were able to set up news sites online, were able to use Facebook to disseminate information. And we just had a lunch with Maria Teresa of, of uh, Maria Ressa rather of um, Rappler, who uh, said that Rappler was, uh, was founded based on, on, uh, on an online site. But governments were very quick to realize that they too could use this to um, repress <coughs> and surveil journalists and to close them down. And what we are noticing now is how governments are using social media to smear and shut down journalists by blackening their reputation and how online um, attacks on journalists have real physical consequences in the real world. Um, we, have, we have all know about um, Rappler and Maria and what uh, the Duterte regime and government have done 
uh, to uh, smear her. But there are journalists who don't enjoy the kinds of protections that she has who find their lives ruined uh, by um, governments using social media to spread malicious gossip and rumors to put up videos of them um, which are doctored. We, are, we have uh, literally hundreds of cases <laughs> of journalists, not just in um, the developing world, but even here in the United States, who are doxxed online in order to be uh, silenced. Their personal information is, is put out there. Um, in uh, Venezuela recently, uh, we've seen this, the power struggle going on between Maduro and Guaido. What happened is that uh, two journalists that we know have had to leave the country because false information about them were spread online, it puts them in danger. So what we're trying to do is seek ways, practical ways, for journalists to better protect themselves uh, online by not disclosing so much information about themselves on social media platforms um, and being able to establish uh, protocols to protect the, their information, um, their digital security, because it, by protecting themselves, they're also protecting their sources. Um, you would be amazed at the level of ignorance amongst journalists about digital security. <laughs> Unencrypted communications, easy to crack passwords, people crossing borders with iPhones that are stuffed with, their con with all their stories, their photographs, their, con their contacts. Anyone, including in the United States, can take that and in seconds can download it all. So we're, tr we're trying through uh, uh, awareness raising campaigns, going out, talking to journalists, particularly those who are in conflict zones because they are the ones that are, that, that are most, most at risk. Um, governments have latched on to the term fake news. Uh, which is being propagated here by the president. I mean, for example, uh, we do an annual census of journalists imprisoned, and last year, 28 out of the 250 journalists that we said were behind bars were on false or fake news charges. That's to say um, that they, uh, governments are using this blanket charge of propagating fake news as a means of, of silencing, uh, silencing journalists. The Social media companies that you, you, uh, that you reference, they have a role in uh, mo uh, mo moderating the content that's on their, uh, on their platforms. But the, the, the real villains that we're working uh, at to, to counter are the governments, because they're the ones with uh, the bigger means. Um, I would just finish by saying that this is a new threat. It's a threat that's not understood by uh, journalists that are not particularly uh, tech savvy. It's a threat that is pernicious because you cannot always see uh, that you're being uh, surveilled, monitored, you're mined for your contacts, and uh, generally imperiled by um, not just governments, but we've also seen malicious uh, private uh, groups, um, others using uh, what was supposed to be a technology to liberate journalists and allow more information to flow and to provide platforms for more publications being used as a form of censorship uh, and intimidation. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Diane, you talk about your own work, the Floyd Foundation's work in terms of disinformation and attacking the press. Thank you, David. I, I'd primarily like to say I'm, I'm not an esteemed journalist like any of these gentlemen um, seated with me, or any of you for that matter. I'm merely the mother of uh, a passionate American journalist, James Foley, who gave his life for the truth. And so I'm really here as a cheerleader for all you good journalists, really. Um, I don't this is a very confusing time, not just for journalists, but a time that's incredibly confusing for the public. I mean, I think of the, a lot of the public really don't know who to believe, um, feel at times they're manipulated. Some people don't even want to listen to the news because they, they just don't know what is news, what isn't. So it's a very confusing time. And I think as journalists, in many ways, we're the key. We're the cornerstone. I think you are the cornerstone to our democracy, to freedom. 
So I think it's a time, as Maria Ressa said at the, um, at the luncheon we just experienced, it's the best and the worst time to be a journalist, really. I mean, it's the worst time in that, just like Rob is saying, journalists are, are being attacked. They are just being attacked. They're being followed, manipulated, maligned, you know, attacked in the worst ways. But it's also a time when journalists, the best journalists, like all of you who will be here at SPJ's um, uh, convention conference, this is the time when you can shine. This is the time when journalism can show the moral courage to do just what we're call you're called to do in this code of ethics. You can seek the truth and report it. You can make sure that you fact check. You can make sure that you're using original sources. You can make sure that you're not being manipulated and rushed into presenting a story where you might not have all the facts. You can work to minimize harm. You can become really shrewd at encryption at use of um, digital security so that you can protect yourself, your sources, your um, own family, your private information, and your subjects. It's a time when journalists can really do this in an amazing way. You can also show our country that you can act independently, that you're not owned by media companies, by businesses, that you, in fact, are here to serve public interest. And you can be accountable and transparent when you make mistakes. I mean, that's part of being human, right? Jim has challenged me in a huge way. Um, and I'd just like to read a little quote of Jim's because it, I think it's our challenge as we go forward. Um, it's certainly been mine. And he, he said it one talk when he had come home from Libya. He said, for some reason, I have physical courage. But really, to think about it, that's nothing compared to moral courage. I can go and get those shots, but if I don't have the moral courage to challenge authority, to write about things that maybe are going to have reprisals on my career, if I don't have that moral courage, we don't have journalism. And I would add, we, don't, we won't have our democracy. So thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Diane. Um, and I'm just going to ask quickly one of the, each of them one one or two questions. Um, Christoph, one thing one of your initiatives is the journalism trust initiative, and again this is the same question. So you you know look, uh, President Trump could you know announce a journalism trust initiative and say, you know. The outlets he likes are the ones you can trust. So how do you create this trust initiative? How do you, it will be attacked. There was already Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov mm -hmm. criticized you for starting this effort, that it was a Western propaganda tool. How do you counter that Russian message? Today, if you respect this, you are the victim of unfair competition. Mm -hmm. There is a distortion of competition. <coughs> if you do honestly your work as a journalist, if you pay to investigate, if you do not circulate extremist contents or crazy things, false, but so that that can be amplified by algorithm, you will not be seen. Your economic model will dissolve, and you will personally, as an individual, as individual, survive. But in fact, journalism will be uh, decreasing. So the question is, how create incentives for all those who respect the basic principles of journalism regarding editorial independence? transparency, use of verification and correction methods, and compliance with ethics. 
should we ask the government to Trump to do this? Well, of course not. Should we ask to platforms? In fact, it's as dangerous as if it would be um, <coughs> governments. So what do we do? What we decided is to create a sort of trusted third party mechanism without having somebody who says this is honest or this is not honest, but defining standards in a very inclusive way. SPJ is part of it. Alex Tarquinio uh, went to the last uh, uh, meeting in the UNESCO uh, building in, in Paris. Together, journalistic stakeholders and consumers organizations create the standards. So nobody defines this is these standards will not be the standards of RSF. This will be the standard established on a sort of consensus principle by all the stakeholders. Then the market or will allow for certification. In democracies, there is a market of certification, so uh, just we have to certify the certifica certifiers. We do work with the content, uh, certified content coalition. And then we need all the stakeholders, as I said, to really give incentives. And when we met at first with Google and Facebook, they said, uh, no, we are not interested. That's so European, what you are doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we answered is, first, we are in the process of democracy destruction. Second, you are trying to get technological solutions. Let's just have a look on technological indicators, signals, and we will, our, our algorithm will be able to make decisions on the basis of this information. But for the moment, technology is not everywhere. <coughs> and human beings are doing things. And fortunately, technology cannot exactly know how human beings act, according to which processes. And so they need such a system. And that's why Google and Facebook officially registered to this um, uh, to this uh, initiative. The advertisers, I'm not, I don't know if advertisers are honest or not, but they say that they need indicators to give their money to media outlets which deserve it. Regulatory bodies, I don't know exactly the FCCs, but in many countries, uh, regulatory bodies nowadays, they sign a uh, um, conventions with TV outlets from all over the world. They stipulate that there should be editor independence, that no way to verify. Philanthropists, even, when they give their money, it's easy to know th how the New York Times or Washington Post work. It's not so easy to know how this newspaper in another country works. So we need to create sort of distinctions, but based on principles. Because we are now living in a sort of law of the jungle system. And the law of the jungle has never been the law of democracy. Democracies, democratic models, like journalism, are composed by freedoms, by rights, and duties. And they have to be, it has to be coordinated. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, a famous American journalist and and the writer Walter Lippmann said in the 20s that the crisis of Western democracy, it was the 20s, uh, of course, last century, is strictly speaking a crisis of journalism. Mm -hmm. so true. So true. So true. Thank you, Christoph. Um, Rob, you talked about supporting journalists when they get doxxed and, and harassed. Is there, and I'm going to ask Diane the same question, do you feel like the public at least in the US or around the world even understands how journalism works? Are there efforts by CPJ to sort of, so instead of just supporting people getting out there and, and lobbying the public, 
or when you visit a country, it's simply you, you go to the government and ask them to halt this activity. And again, it's this theme of how do you counter this disinformation? Yeah, well, we're, we're focused at the Committee to Protect Journalists on protecting journalists. So um, when we go out, we try to um, point journalists at resources or give them, give them material resources that they can use to help protect themselves. It's true that, you know, um, it would be great if the public understood better how, how journalists and reporters work and what some of the, uh, the dangers that they face are. And we try, but that's really not our core uh, uh, responsibility. What, what we're trying to do is to help journalists keep themselves out of jail, keep themselves safe, um, and that's becoming a, a more and more difficult task. There are more people in committing acts of journalism than ever before mm -hmm. because the technology uh, permits people to uh, to publish and there are, there is repression if you look at the figures that RSF and, and and we put out in terms of attacks on journalists whether through legal means or violence and physical attacks jailings and killings the the, the, the figures over the last uh, 10 years are, are in a trend which is up and so um, I think it's 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 important, as Christoph has been saying, to fight in the public square to keep um, the the whole uh, ecosystem of journalism healthy. But it's also important that we stop such uh, violence as was perpetrated against James Foley and others when they are when they're reporting, and we give people before they go out the awareness and the uh, the tools to better protect themselves. Um, it's not just governments, it's what <laughs> people call violent non-state actors, that, that is, you know, uh, private militias, uh, groups affiliated to um, uh, certain political and, 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 reli and, and religious movements, and uh, private corporations, and in the cases of countries just next door in Mexico, organized crime and drug cartels. They're murdering journalists and intimidating journalists at, at, in, in, in great numbers. And to ignore that um, is to uh, you know, be derelict in our responsibility to try to save people uh, from, from harm. And I, I just want to ask a follow-up. Um, I mean, with, with Jim's death and an earlier era, the fear was sort of the terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers are up in terms of people that are jailed. Is the problem becoming more and more governments, or is it still mixed? It's mixed, but I mean, it's governments that have jails and armies and police forces. So if the numbers of journalists in jail is rising, that's because of, of governments. And there are new actors on the scene. I mean, uh, I, uh, you know, before the Arab Spring, there were no journalists in jail in Egypt. There's now at least 25. Why is that? It's because the government uh, is, is able to get away with it. Uh, it, it's, it can manipulate public opinion domestically, and there seems to be very little in the f terms of international sanction against countries who are jailing journalists. Turkey is one of the biggest jailers of journalists in the world, with nearly 70 journalists behind bars. It's a member of NATO. It was knocking on the door of the European Union just a few years ago. But how often does it get called out for what it's doing? And just one last thing. Uh, people complain that President Trump is not calling people out. But are other governments failing to do so also? It depends. It's, look, the, uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi just uh, six months ago was a good illustration. How many governments around the world condemned Saudi Arabia publicly. I don't think there was a single Arab government that I saw, maybe Qatar, uh, as an exception. Why? Um, well, because national and diplomatic in, and commercial interests uh, act as a break on, on such condemnation. Oil. <laughs> in a way. Um, Diane, um, and I'm on the board of uh, Diane's Foundation. I, I talked about this theme of trying to explain to the public what journalists do. That's a big part of what the foundation has tried to do. You've shown there's a documentary you can talk about about Jim and his life, which is does sort of educate people about how journalists work and the dangers they face. There's the curriculum at, at universities, but how do you try to get you know the American public to treasure you know conflicts journalists like Jim and the risks that they. Well, that is one of our challenges, but 
I am, have become incredibly passionate about the protection of journalists, as Rob says, because too many talented journalists don't know how to protect themselves. They don't know how to protect um, their, their sources, their colleagues, their subjects, their loved ones. And so part of what the James um, W. Foy Legacy Foundation has done is worked on a curriculum for schools of journalism that don't have a lot of emphasis on safety. The big schools tend to. I mean, like Columbia has the Dart Center and Missouri, some of these great schools do understand the challenges. But some of the smaller schools of communication and such are not arming our student, young aspiring journalists with real, true skills at um, protecting their work protecting themselves. So we're very passionate about that. We have a graduate curriculum that deals with digital security, that deals with domestic unrest, and uses um, uh, Jim, the James Foley um, story, that documentary, just to raise awareness of some of our idealistic young students who want to do great things in the world. Not always journalists, sometimes they're educators or um, humanitarian or whatever, and we need our great young people out in the world, but I feel very passionate about the fact that they need to be shrewd and savvy about protecting themselves. So that's a big part of what we do. I also feel it's what um, SPJ is doing here today is the bringing together of all of us. All of us have a bit to add. Together, we can, God willing, protect our democracy, protect the vital role that journalism does in our world that keeps us free. Um, but we all need to work together on this. So I just think it's vital that we come together. And that's what we did with the Alliance for a Culture of Safety, because too many freelance um, journalists are out there on their own. And so we brought, we brought together partly under David Rhodes' um, leadership with RSF and um, CPJ to work on alliance to protect um, freelancers and their work. Um, thank you, Diane. Christoph, I just want to uh, push you for a bit here. You mentioned the word certifiers. Does that, so there's the Information and Democracy Commission. Who are the certifiers and how will that work? Uh, it's about the Journalism Trust yes. Initiative. Yes, sorry. In fact, because um, I'm just, you, we're you, looking no, for you concrete tactics. Just you you and, need yes. to compare um, the standards, the basic principles of journalism, mm -hmm. and the way how they are really implemented, the processes. So you need somebody to make the comparison. And this is a certifier. This is something, in, in fact, very neutral. It's not to stamp something. It's just uh, um, to verify implementation of. of um, but the of, news organization of, of follows these with, with basic processes. Processes. Uh, uh, and journalism, journalism is a process. Mm -hmm. In fact, this is nothing else than a process which has to respect certain principles. So those words, standardization, certification, can be very ugly for journalists. <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. Some I'm, of you consider, no. whoa, what are those words? But in fact, it, it's just about having guarantees about r the processes. So it really makes sense for journalism. And then, if you if a, if the New Yorker follows those processes, processes, are we somehow uh, endorsed, or is there some? How do we show the public that we are following these things and a sort of trusted in fact, media organization? I doubt we doubt that just informing, letting the public know that we are good guys, we work well, is enough. Mm -hmm. What is important is. Will you be, uh, as a newspaper, will you be in the, in the newsstand? If you are not in the newsstand, you will never be able to run journalistic activities. So that's exactly the same with algorithms. Hmm. Um, and I'm just, one last thing, you said, so the initial reception was not good from Facebook, and now they've signed on. Yes. 
I mean, are what arguments are? I'm, I'm just curious. Are persuasive to, to Facebook? What? How did just you, how did you turn our them arguments around? were uh, uh, and with Google, you do not have any other solution. If you do not do this, you will continue to endanger democracy. People will consider dismantling you. Um, I'm not sure it would make sense to dismantle Google. How would you? That's not ATT. It's not the same. AT&T, sorry, it's not the same logic. Um, and you need such indicators. If you, if you want just to avoid um, to, to, to develop this unfair competition, which give incentives to, to f which incentivize, in fact, false information as compared with um, verified trustworthy news and information. And it's also an unfair competition between despotic regimes and democracies. Because despotic regimes, that they can control their public space, um, export their contents under control, even like China exports their models of control, um, uh, their anti-models. Um, and that's what we do. Uh, we recently published a, um, a report about the new world um, media order that uh, China uh, is trying to set up. Um, and so, as strong strongmen are taking the lead. And what is really changing, and I, th I think we, even for our more classical advocacy work, we have to reinvent it. I was recently in a country where there are a lot of number, uh, um, a lot of journalists in jail. And uh, I spoke with the people there on this. Now, when a Western president or says to them, oh, please, or even publicly says, you should release this person. Do you know what they answer officially? And public, not publicly, of course. If you say something about this guy, he will stay longer in jail. <coughs> That's exactly where we are now. So we have to find ways to enter new power relations to be able to mobilize good guys, at least those who want to defend democratic models, to re-enter power relations with them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, yes, Duterte, uh, CC, and others will just continue. They do not really care with the naming and shaming strategy. And so we have to find new ways. They need investments. They have their own laws. We, we have to sometimes even to, to speak with them if needed. That's what we believe, not only name and shame. Um, I just want to point out, uh, Christophe has been traveling a great deal the last week, most of all, but in the last few weeks he's been in Portugal, Bulgaria, and Turkey working on specific cases. He's flying back to Paris tonight, <laughs> and we're lucky to have him here. Um, Rob, you said there were specific cases you wanted to talk about in the Philippines, India, and Venezuela. That I guess talk in terms. Well, of I mean, Maria, Maria, Maria would we be already Philippines. talked about yes. Venezuela. I, I mean, in India, I just think that what we've noticed is, since, for example, you had the election of the Modi government, that there has been an increase online of targeting of journalists, um, and we have had uh, any any journalist that uh, seems to take a, a critical view of of the government. Um, it is at peril, particularly female journalists, of being trolled and harassed on social media. And we have had a number of cases. We had a, a Kashmiri photographer. They put up a picture of her with the word spy underneath the caption of the pic. It caused incredible danger to someone to be labeled a spy in, in, in a place like Kashmir. We had a, an Indian journalist, Rana Ayub, who was uh, trolled online, accused of um, uh, protecting a child rapist. It's got nothing to do with her journalism, but once that accusation goes out, it's, it's got this incredible power to be amplified by social media. And the real world consequences are that people come knocking on your door or they, uh, they start attacking you. And these are new dangers for journalists. It didn't used to be like this. Um, and that's, these are smear campaigns of misinformation. It's attacking the people who are trying to hold power to account. So those who are in power 
are using the tools that we as journalists want to use to bring transparency and hold people to account against us. And that's a new phenomenon. It's insidious and it's widespread. It's on different kinds of platforms. The different countries have favored platforms. It could be Twitter in this uh, place, Facebook somewhere else, Telegram in a lot of countries. Um, they are now used as, as, as they're weaponized against journalists. Um, and my last question will open it up, but Diane, um, part of the things that the Flay Foundation does is sort of you go to Capitol Hill, you lobby lawmakers both about freeing Americans held hostage, but about press freedom. It, you know, what are those interactions like? Are there lawmakers that listen to you and care about these issues, or is it, you know, what do you think the environment is in the U.S.? Well, it's a very challenging environment in the U.S., as you know. And I, I think just recently, just within the last couple of months, we hired um, an executive um, director to be based in Washington for that very reason. Because we haven't done nearly enough work on um, with our congressmen, with our senators. We really need advocates within our government who understand the threat the attack our democracy is under. And and it's a subtle, insidious, sometimes subtle, sometimes not, but um, it's it's an attack, as you're saying. And and the fact that it's happening here, you know, is very daunting, you know, to witness. Um, so that is partly why we are, yes, finding different, um, identifying people who have the courage, who have the moral courage within government to stand up no matter what side of the aisle they're on, but to really recognize the risks um, our country is facing. So um, we're just beginning it, however. Um, but it, it, it's vital that the um, public and our Congress become educated about it. Yeah. So some good news there. Um, I want to open up the questions. Um, Anyone can raise their hand. It's a small auditorium. We should be able to hear you. Thank you. Oh, here comes the microphone. If you can just um, state your name and. Sure. I'm Patty Newberry. I'm uh, the president elect of SPJ, so I'll be after Alex. Oh. Uh, I'd like to ask about uh, this, this common refrain that we hear that. Trump's vilification of the press has emboldened leaders in other countries to follow suit. And I wonder if that's true, if we've seen kind of a spreading of this um, anti-press rhetoric, rhetoric and action because of Trump, or does it predate him? Christoph or Rob, you, you, you travel more internationally. It's difficult to say if it's because of Trump or if the same phenomenon started in other countries. But we can see that even in European countries, and the uh, European Union is um, in, in a World Press Freedom Index uh, the best continents for press freedom, as compared with Americas globally and <coughs> Africa, etc. cetera. Um, even in those countries, um, in those countries there are a lot of uh, leaders who really weaken journalism through like hate speech. In Slovakia, for years, the prime minister insulted journalists. An investigative reporter has been killed. In Malta, a small isol in the Mediterranean Sea, a journalist, an investigative journalist has been killed. In um, the Czech Republic, this is a democracy. The president, the current president, has made a press conference with a Kalashnikov in his hands of Mo Kalashnikov, but it was written for journalists. And when he met a journalist in the corridors of the European Parliament a few days after, he said to his bodyguards, get rid of him, or I will kill him. And he spoke with Putin with, about those topics. What an atmosphere for journalists. And you have all those who take this occasion to adopt fake news laws, False, false information, disinformation is for sure a real challenge, but a lot of them take this occasion to adopt laws just to control you know, news and information. Uh, in Singapore, a new law is, is being passed, etc. So, um, 
yes, this starts to be a, a, a global phenomenon. And, and uh, in fact, we, we often speak about state propaganda, but the main um, source of disinformation is probably um, um, uh, sorry, I have to uh, problem to translate, but during electoral campaign in India, mm -hmm. in Mexico, in Brazil, through political parties. They can just send three million emails with different contents, just adapted to the targets, uh, using private channels like WhatsApp. So this is regulated as a, as a private channel. This is to totally new. Uh, 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 the legal framework is not adapted to this. And by the way, is it freedom of expression to send three million emails that are not the same and that do not depend on the source, but on the guy who receives it? So that's why we have to reconsider all those topics. I think that the base, <laughs> the intellectual base, legal base, B basis, sorry, uh, intellectual basis, legal basis of what we work about has totally changed. And, and we have to, to have new eyes to work with, to, 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 not to, to work with uh, the former logics. Can, can I? Yes, Rob, is it all President Trump's fault? That's my question. <laughs> um, I don't want to make a, a, a partisan comment, but let me just say this. There, there is no science about this. We can't say that there was, uh, there was no fake news uh, charges levied against journalists before Trump. But let's, let's, let's look at it from the other angle, which was that despite all the, uh, the problems that, that may have existed with US foreign policy and support of certain uh, leaders over others, one could expect the United States president to stand up for press freedom and First Amendment values on the international stage. That uh, moral authority is undermined if the, if the leader of the free world is constantly dismissing the press as the enemy of the people and is smearing the work and the investigative reporting of journalists as fake news. That's a constant refrain. It is picked up uh, outside of the US and we have seen uh, uh, presidents like the Philippine president Duterte mimic uh, Trump and dismiss all the good work done by people like Maria Ressa as fake news. Um, there were laws on the statute books of, of countries around the world for uh, against um, spreading false information, spreading propaganda. They were used, but now they're all uh, they're, they're, they're all lumped under the fake news. Um, Banner. Where did they get that idea, I wonder? So what we have is, I think, a, um, a deficit in the, uh, the, the U.S. leadership role in defending press freedom, and that's bad for us all. It's bad here, for us here, but it also, in a way, gives a certain amount of permission <laughs> to other leaders to uh, undermine the work of the press. Goodness knows there's enough uh, challenges without uh, liberal Western democracies not standing up vociferously uh, for uh, journalists and journalism. Thank you. Other questions? Up in the, the top. Thank you. Your husband will ask a question to you. Uh, I hope not. <laughs> Hi, um, Melissa Wasser, Director of News Media of Open Government for Open Government. Um, something that Rob mentioned in the misinformation, I guess it's a question for everybody, but um, there's an election coming up, and we hear, again, fake news all the time. Um, something that bothers me sometimes when I go on the Hill is talking with staffers or talking with congressmen and women about um, certain issues that they just don't understand. We talked about how journalists sometimes don't understand the technology aspect of what's going on. Um, something that's been bothering me is this idea of deep fakes, which are videos that are being altered um, of people saying things that are not true. Um, there's a video out of President Obama saying some really crazy things and it cuts to Jordan Peele's impression of him and they've merged the videos together. So my question is as we move forward with all of these threats of 
uh, misinformation and election security coming up in 2020, how can journalists be at the forefront of identifying these ways of misinformation? Um, what are the best ways that journalists can be you know, fighting back against this and what can we explain to people on the Hill of why this is so important? They, they're already talking about it, but they do need more information. How can we help? Go ahead. Um, there are solutions, but a lot of solutions that are really limited, like um, fact-checking. Fact-checking is great. But the capacity of fact-checking of all newsrooms all over the world are about a few thousand articles a day. Nothing as compared uh, with um, uh, the con new contents that are published. <laughs> and, and really, fact-checking is, is, is great, by the way. Um, and unfortunately, it does, does not convince a lot of people when they believe something else. They don't believe. Mm -hmm. There's something that we didn't say, is we should also take this occasion to have a look at ourselves as journalists. Mm -hmm. Because we should answer those questions. Why do so many people consider that we are not useful anymore? And what do so many people prefer to believe in false information, even if they know it is factually false, instead of believing in true facts? Why do they consider there is more truth in what some politicians say even when it is pure lies. There must be a reason. And, and we have to, to, to check why there, there is such um, a, a break of trust, possibly because they consider that we didn't represent all the interests in the same way, that they, it was a bit unbalanced for a lot of reasons, mm -hmm. economic reasons, sociological reasons, et cetera. And, and we have to address this topic. And, and I, to my personal opinion, I, I too often see journalists who say, we will never be able to, to speak again with those people. They are really mm -hmm. stupid, they are, et cetera. They do not understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We should understand the rational. And in fact, they are, of course, totally crazy people, violent people, et cetera. But there is something also that we lost and that this is our challenge to rebuild this and, and to rebuild the way we work by uh, complying with this and by setting up a real pluralism. Absolutely. And I agree so much, Christophe. I think there's just so much we can do, you can do as journalists, but the best thing all of us can do is to be as ethical a journalist as we can. It's a huge challenge in these days. And also, I feel it's unacceptable for a journalist to be just totally inept at technology. A, a journalist needs to understand how to use technology and how it is used. I think, uh, you know, it really goes hand in hand today because of the changing landscape. So it, these are very challenging times, but this is what we're called to do, you know? And I think in many ways our democracy is in the hands of us, of you. And yeah. I, um, I just wanted to add that there is also a responsibility on the part of the companies that have these platforms and own them. Mm -hmm. And this is a fairly new technology. We're still trying as a society to come to terms with how we use it. And that, nevertheless, I think it is incumbent upon the companies to clean up their platforms. They're trying to do it. We talk about bots that are sending out millions of spoof uh, emails or uh, flagging of content. I am still very hesitant about having private corporations uh, censor the news for us. They call it content moderation, but it's actually a kind of editing. Thing. For a long time, uh, the companies like Facebook, Google, and others uh, claimed intermediary liability was not something that affected them. They wanted to be like the phone company. They, were, they provided the wires, and they were responsible for the message. 
that's changing. We're now looking at you know uh, spoof accounts on Twitter or on Facebook, and we're we're looking to to find that balance between uh, having the user be able to identify what is what is true or isn't, and use the on-off button if they don't like the content, and then having the companies moderate that content so that we don't get child pornography. But w what about um, you know you, when they've tried to moderate nudity, for example, they've cut out artwork. Uh, uh, Botticelli gets uh, censored. So th they're trying, but I think they have a, a responsibility to clean up their platforms, particularly ahead of elections, that they identify spoof accounts, that they identify deep fake videos, they can flag them. We can't, um, we can't uh, give uh, total responsibility to them, but I, I do think that um, there is an expectation now that not just governments tackle this problem, but that corporations, the for-profit corporations do so too. Um, a last question from Dr. John Foley, yeah. Jim's father. An inspiring and journalist, how do I proceed? <laughs> tell me how I move to tell the truth to the world. Well, I understand all the risks. Give me, give me a path. What do I do? Do I give up? Do I do I rely on my courage? Do I accept my fate? Well, what is what is the way forward here? I, I've heard all of, all of the pitfalls and the and the dangers. Tell me how I can do my duty. How can I tell the truth and be heard? Follow this. <laughs> first of all, I'm dead serious. That's why my, my one quick thing. Go ahead, Christophe. Uh, I totally agree, thanks of this, but also we have our own contradiction. Uh, when I say, I say we, I mean um, uh, we citizens, consumers, mm -hmm. because we want <coughs> Google, Facebook and others to clean up. Mm -hmm. But if they decide to take off uh, violent uh, contents, because of violence, etc., mm -hmm. we will say, oh, this is censorship. We are not legitimate to do this. If they keep it, if they keep it, we will say, "Oh, that's terrible! You are endangering journalists and others." So that's why we have to take action to define really principles mm -hmm. and to find ways so that they have to implement principles that are not their principles, mm -hmm. but the principles of the community. That's exactly the, the work that we have to do. So journalists have to exercise their jobs. As, um, as, um, as, as good um, uh, as they can. Uh, and we also have to create the conditions so that journalists can exercise their jobs and other citizens can have access to trustworthy news and information without giving this um, work to either just Zuckerberg or Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. Rob, I, you, I, yeah, yes. To try to uh, look. Um, we're talking about a primeval human urge to tell stories, to talk to people, to hear their stories, and to tell that story. That's what journalism is. It's, it's storytelling. And I meet a lot of uh, young people at journalism schools and communication schools, and they're as passionate about doing that as I was. I won't tell you how many years ago when I started out in journalism. Um, so there's no lack of there's no lack of desire. I think all we want to do is to make sure that those those journalists that do go out and that goes to what you were saying, Diane, when they go to uh, places where they could endanger themselves or others, that they are as prepared as possible to to do that. When I started out in journalism, there was absolutely no safety training. You were sent and you looked at what older people who had survived were doing, and if they were good, they took you under their wing. You had no protective equipment. You had nothing uh, in, in terms of uh, safety uh, protocols to follow. Uh, you know, you checked in with your editor every now and again, and if you were still there, they were fine, but they didn't really care where you were as long as, um, as, long as you checked in and filed a copy. That's changed completely because the dangers have, have changed. And I think that as long as we do our duty towards those young people that want to do journalism, they will continue to do it, and I hope to goodness that what we're saying here doesn't put anybody off, because I still think it, it's it, it's a it's a great calling. Any last word, Diane? It's it's an essential calling, Rob. I mean, it really I really feel in many ways that journalism is the cornerstone of our democracies, of our freedom. So if we don't step up, if we don't figure it out. 
um, you know, we're all good on, or our kids are going to be at risk. So it's an amazing challenge. But thanks to good people like all of you and us, I think there's great hope on the horizon. And I just appreciate all of the hope that all of you give me. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex and SPJ for having us here. Let's, let's all uh, keep fighting and keep telling stories. Thank you, Christoph and Rob and Diane.